In these interviews, personally recorded by Maurice Gross, Birkin relives his experiences at the Hodgson home. And while the family holidayed in Essex, Birkin had a particularly disturbing encounter. I saw, sitting at the living room table, a man. He was sitting with his back towards me, sitting on the chair at the table. He had a white with a blue striped shirt on. Grey hair, not too thick. I looked at him and it went through my mind to say, what's your bleeding game, mate? Where'd you come? What are you doing in here? You said nothing. You I just thought it. I thought this was thoughts that went through my mind. I was a I suppose in all honesty I was about to say something, but I sort of then realised the house I was in. I closed my eyes like a blink for a couple of seconds, opened my eyes, gone. I left the house like a rocket. You didn't stay for oh, I did not stay at all. Were you very scared? I was well You were very scared. I was scared and I and quite honestly, I came back and said to my wife, I said, I'm sorry, no way do I go in that house again on my own. The bleeding place is haunted. Similar experiences of alleged apparitions were reported by the family throughout the summer of 1978. Yet these claims were unusual for a poltergeist investigation and many were dubious of this later phenomena. After a while, it, it was almost as if something had to be produced. You know, there were so many people coming through the house, you can't let them down. I can't put my hand on my heart and say anything's right, because I wasn't there. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's second-hand information. After over 12 months of activity, Gross and Playfair finally seemed to be making headway in bringing closure to the Hodgsons. We had visits from a um, Unitarian um, minister who was a friend of mine who was very, very nice and, and um, really just tried to calm the family down and so on. Morris Gross used to do, do a prayer which he felt was helpful. I, I used to do kind of um, spiritist uh, exhortations of the kind that I'd learned in Brazil and um, I think they helped. I was contacted by a Dutch uh, friend, a reporter for the um, the Dutch paper, De Telegraph, and he said, uh, I've got a f friend who's a medium who says he can stop these things. Would you like me to bring him over here and stop it? And I said, yes. The medium, whose name is Dono, is quite well known in the Netherlands. He doesn't speak a word of English, un unusually for a Dutchman. He bought Janet an ice cream and um, chatted with her mother through, through the interpreter and then went up alone to the bedroom uh, where he stayed uh, um, not very long, I think about 20 minutes. And then he came down and um, said, uh, that's it, I mean, uh, forget the exact words, I mean, they were in Dutch, but what they amounted to was, um, it's gone away. And sure enough, it had. I mean, that may have been a brilliant demonstration of the power of suggestion. But I, I don't care what you call it, it worked. So after 14 months, the events at the house on Green Street had ended. But what had caused these occurrences? And would the alleged poltergeist return? I'm pretty sure in this case it was, it was, the, it was the family and not, not the house. We didn't find any evidence that there was anything unusual about the house at all. No, there hadn't been any previous reports of um, trouble. And it was quite an old house. I think it was built in about the 20s. I don't think anybody's in control except the poltergeist. I mean, they do things their own way. You ask them to do something, they do just the opposite. I mean, they're not there to, to, uh, to enlighten you, they're there to cause, cause problems, which they certainly do. Well, to be honest, nobody can quite explain why they come and nobody can quite explain why they go. There are various theories about this, about uh, some kind of human frustrations or some kind of energy that one hardly knows about. And there was a very, very minor outbreak about six months later, which only lasted a very short time, a day or two, I think. And since then, nothing. While things were returning to something approaching normality for the Hodgsons, 
they were just getting started for Barrington. In compiling the Enfield Poltergeist Investigation Committee report, she spoke at length to all those involved in the investigation. I personally, like most other members of the society, um, got involved at a rather late date. So my personal involvement was really just interviewing the family and some of the other witnesses and m making my own report on my assessment of uh, whether I thought they were telling the truth or whether I thought they were really credit worthy. So what did Barrington make of the testimonies of those who had experienced the events firsthand? I was impressed by Mrs. Hodgson. I thought she was a very worried woman. I never thought for a moment that she was uh, inventing anything. But were the children's statements as reliable? The two girls, well, they were different. Janet seemed to be rather very tomboyish and jumping around all the time. Margaret much more sedate. Um, no, I couldn't. I really could not tell whether I thought they were fooling around. I'm, I'm quite impressed by the fact that now grown up, they both insist that it was genuine. I think that is quite impressive because when you're no longer the centre of attention as a poltergeist focus, you can make yourself the centre of attention again by saying that it was all uh, you're playing around and fraud. So what did the report conclude? Was this a case of genuine poltergeist activity or an elaborate hoax? I wrote a short summary of our conclusions, which were that, roughly speaking, um, there was every reason to think that there was poltergeist activity in the house, though uh, there was a lot of it that we thought was uh, at, at best unproved. So finally, a line was drawn under this bizarre series of events. Soon after, in 1980, Playfair's book, This House is Haunted, was published to much critical scrutiny and acclaim. I think it's an important landmark book um, for all investigators because it, it catalogues from the very start to the very end of the, um, of the activity that occurred and it's not done with uh, any glamorisation or, um, or any sensationalisation. The story is just told as it is. So what is the legacy of the Enfield case? One thing that as investigators we are aware of is the copycat effect. This um, it happens with UFO cases, you know, where you know you have a, a massive sighting which is reported in the press. Then all of a sudden, everybody's seeing UFOs. It happens with ghosts and hauntings and poltergeist cases as well. And those sort of things occurred after the Enfield case. But what became of the Hodgsons and those at the centre of this apparent supernatural whirlwind? To me, it was easily the most fascinating thing that's ever happened in my life. You know, I mean, that beyond shadow of now. So it was fascinating to be a, a witness of the whole thing and just stand there and watch it. The story did affect me. The position of that, that family, so impoverished and underprivileged and un unable to cope. That family did not ever really become a particularly happy family. Nearly 30 years later, they certainly haven't forgotten it and Mrs. Hodgson, who sadly died recently, um, she was very much affected by the whole thing and um, it's very, very upsetting and it's something you can't ever really get over. The Enfield poltergeist changed the way the public perceived supernatural phenomena. It opened people's minds to the idea of a world beyond their own and made the nation ask, if this can happen to a normal family in a house in North London, then could it happen to me?